So please welcome Daniel Schmachtenberger. Hey, <laughs> thank you. So Daniel, if we just fast forward to 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, just really go into the future. What would an ideal hospital look like? Well, I think in this open space, a lot of ideas were being brought up about that yesterday as well. I think everybody has a clear sense that the environmental design and environmental psychology of the space is a huge part of it. The airflow, the lighting, both natural lighting and um, the right spectrum and the right amount of lumens and really paying attention to the way the environment is affecting the health and the experience of the people in the space. So the actual design of the infrastructure of the building itself. I think the nature of the amount of time and also the amount of time that the providers get to spend with people and also their training for the quality of time and how they spend it. I think there's a lot of things we know about the tech that we want to see in terms of both much higher quality and less invasive diagnostics and there's a lot of diagnostic tech that by some of those dates will be online that isn't now that'll make a huge difference. Um, the kind of dream of Theranos that they didn't, write, didn't really have the tech for, there, there is tech that will achieve things like that. There's a company called Gene Radar uh, coming out of a company called Nanobiosim that I think will probably make huge progress in that time and other tech like it where instead of needing reagents to be able to do blood labs, we can simply do uh, chip-based amplification. And so a single drop of blood can be able to measure every biometric. And if you imagine not having the cost associated, then just run every biometric every time on everyone, run big data analysis on an individual person longitudinally over their life, plus on lots of people. And that's not just in the hospital, that can be decentralized so that we start finding early disease indicators and being able to prevent most things um, so I think there's a bunch of examples of better diagnostics and machine learning that can augment the human doctor and healthcare provider capacity so that the healthcare provider can be much more focused on actually connecting to people and taking in the kind of diagnostic info that humans are uniquely good at that machines don't do as good a job at, mm -hmm. which is less biometric specified and more being able to get the gestalt of the person that lets you even know what to look for and how to interpret it. Um, so there's a lot of things like this that we could talk about. Um, one of them was mentioned yesterday that I just feel like bringing up is uh, the idea that the hospital would feel more like a sacred place, like a temple of mm -hmm. some sort, seems to be at the heart. If, if we put that at the heart of the consideration, a lot of other things make more sense. Yeah. And when you talk about heart-based medicine, Obviously, we want a medicine that is uh, really excellent in terms of operations. And we want a medicine that's really excellent in terms of the actual science and the technology of it. But what's motivating all of it is the sacredness of human life and human experience and wanting to be able to support people to have the highest quality experience and the highest quality capacity to offer what it is to offer while they're here. And so that everyone in the healthcare space remembers and continuously that that's actually why they're there. And the entire design is around supporting that experience. You know, you were talking about experiences where people died in your care and where they died in ways that were really uh, beautiful versus painful based on the nature of the care. So if you think about a hospital as a place where people will be born and people will die and people will be brought back from death and people will have the chance to have a totally different life trajectory based on the care they get. Like the sacredness of life is more on the altar there than maybe anywhere else. Yeah. And um, I, I would like to see something where the doctors and nurses go through a ritual before they actually enter every time, not that it becomes a dogma because the moment 
the moment that there is an intrinsically recognized dharma that becomes a protocol and becomes a dogma, then obviously it just becomes performative, lifeless, and then you either do the performative thing or just reject it. But if someone actually kind of reconnected to the most beautiful experiences they had in medicine, the most heart-wrenching experiences, why they were there, what the Hippocratic Oath was, and why they're there, the way that would affect the quality of the interactions, and not just from the point of view that the patient's experience would be better, but also the actual quality of the care would make a tremendous difference. So we, we could talk about a lot of things based on specifically what we anticipate might be available in those different timelines, what things we could do retrofitting existing hospitals versus where we'd need to build them from the ground up, mm -hmm. what things where we're still thinking of a hospital versus where we start to think about decentralizing healthcare into all of life. So that's a start. Uh, wonderful, thank you. So many open questions. Let's, um, you were putting the temple in the center. So maybe let's start at the center. <laughs> um, and I believe it's what you're describing is um, that the subjective experience um, of a true dedication, of a true interest of the healthcare provider. So rather than busy, being busy with themselves, but actually truly caring about the person they're under in their care, that subjective experience will improve the quality of care, not only in terms of making less mistakes. I, this is, I realized this the first time when I, you know, I learned to make all these prescriptions and so here you go and here's another one and here's another one and here's another one and you're just describing. And then I realized suddenly my kids were in hospital. And I sat there and said, like, okay, all right, now my kids are in hospital. Next one, next one. And I went, hmm, do I really want that? <laughs> Such an important moment to realize that when I see children and I, pres I make prescription based on what their disease is, or I make a prescription for somebody that I have a personal direct relation with, it's somehow there's a moment of hmm there. So the quality, I, I completely agree that the quality of care when we talk about patient safety, a big topic today. Um, we talk about patient safety, we improve the way that healthcare providers show up. This will improve the quality of care, it will improve the safety of the patient, but it will also improve patient satisfaction. And so there's a subjective experience on the other side. So what could you see as steps taken well, now let's start with the end in mind. What would you see in you know, 20, 30, 40, 50? What might be the way that, what might describe or constitute the relation between a healthcare provider and a patient? So you mentioned less mistakes. I think getting rid of all of the avoidable iatrogenic illness is it would take a few things. Increased presence on the part of the doctors and pharmacists and nurses is gonna make a huge difference to that. Uh, it's not only that though, it's also the medical training up front. It's also um, removing the financialization of medicine that ends up influencing the training and the incentive structures of the doctors as long as the hospital has to have the doctors seeing more people per day or in private practice you have to see more people per day, the mistakes are just gonna go up. So. Some of it can be addressed at the bottom-up level of things individual doctors can do. Some of it really has to be addressed at the top-down level of the, of the major top-down institutions that are affecting medicine and optimizing for something other than quality of care. Hmm. And if we have trillions of dollars a year optimizing for things other than quality of care compared to the relatively small level of a few doctors, that it's actually an asymmetric warfare against health, right? As long as at a federal level, we want to optimize GDP, and we, met, we think about GDP as a sign of the success of the country. Sick people are better for GDP than healthy people are in a narrow point of view in terms of medicine. Um, and obviously this is the same for a pharmaceutical company's incentive or things like that. If, if we could just prevent medicine by mm. making healthy people, we would obviously have the best system of healthcare and it would totally tank GDP from both a pharmaceutical and hospital revenue point of view, as well as from the revenue of food, drug, et cetera, companies that make more money off addiction. Yeah. Um, so there's systemic factors, as well as kind of individual practitioner factors that have to be addressed to remove iatrogenic 
disease. Mm. And then as you're mentioning, the, the increased presence of a practitioner with a person who is in one of the most disturbing positions people can be in, where the quality of their life or their loved one's life is like up in the air and they don't have the technical expertise to know how it's going to go, and so they're trusting a stranger with the most precious thing to them. Actually feeling the care and the presence and the attention of that stranger is going to make a huge difference where even if the thing is uncurable, the actual experience of someone is a terminal value in and of itself independent of how that translates to objective outcomes. Mm and it will translate to objective outcomes, both in terms of increased diagnostic insight on the part of the practitioner and a psychologically better state and less stress on the part of the patient is going to help their healing process. So, uh, I mean, this is just kind of recapping why heart-based medicine matters, right? <laughs> and then, um, I don't think any of that answered your question. Your question was, well, how do we... What would constitute the relation between yeah. the healthcare provider and the patient? And so you, you mentioned quality of care, and we started at kind of avoiding mistakes, mm. but we may, just as we look at disease on a systemic level, we look at mistakes. In terms of heart-based medicine, we want to look at, kind of shift the attention a little bit away from disease towards health. So on, on that systemic level, we may want to ask, what is quality of care yeah. when, we, when we shift it towards the positive outcome, towards the potential, and how might that be a constituent of the relationship between... So let me do a long-range version of this. I'm not going to try and specify the timeline. We'll just do a... It will generally be hopefully trending in this direction if it's on the right mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. So let's say we look at the trend of technological automation to automate things that we can proceduralize. Mm -hmm. That'll affect some things in medicine, and hopefully it, it will because that would be great. There are some things that machines can do as well or better. And it won't affect other things, and if it does, that'd be a bummer because they do it less well. Um, but outside of medicine, most of the jobs that people like the least are some of the ones that are most available to technological automation. because it. The more procedural something is, the easier it is to automate. The more procedural it is also, the less creativity and learning is involved, which means we have the less, less intrinsic motive for a human to feel like they can self-actualize there. And so as we progress to more technological automation and more categories, we also start to change a lot of the underlying assumptions within market theory that we need people to do the jobs, so we need to make it to where the people need the jobs. Mm. Well, when we don't need people to do a lot of the jobs, then we can also start to create more of commonwealth resources that take care of people's needs to have a system that is more focused on the intrinsic incentive of people than the extrinsic incentive. When you want to get people to, when you have to get people to do shitty labor stuff, you have to extrinsically incent them. When more of that's automated, then we get to facilitate what is actually intrinsically interesting and meaningful for people, and it's not just playing video games all the time, if they get to be facilitated to recognize that their short time here can actually mean something. <laughs> and I think the things that people will most want to do have to do with connection, creativity, and healing. Mm -hmm. And so I think there will be a lot more people in the healing professions. Uh, and I think rem as we think less and less in terms of how do I think of this as a way to financially support myself and more in terms of if finances were already supported, what would I want to do? A lot of people want to do things that involve connecting with other people in ways that contribute to the quality of their life. And that's everything from like music therapy and art therapy and mm. psycho-spiritual practice mm. to uh, training people's physical bodies and like that. So I think the role of the doctor will become largely decentralized to a lot of other things that are promoting well-being more than just dealing with the after effects of not promoting well-being. Mm. And similarly to when we say removing iatrogenic disease requires not just change on the doctor part, but also the structural incentives that lead to iatrogenic disease. If we want to obsolete as much of medicine as possible, we have to look at what the upstream causes of the problems are. So obviously if we 
if we don't just look at healthcare, but we look at the embedding environment of things that affect people's health, and we're pumping billions of tons of glyphosate and other pesticides and herbicides and petrochemical toxins into the atmosphere and into people's food supply and water supply continuously, and embedding them in the manufacturing process in the carpet and the paint and where all of our environments are actually toxic to the way we genetically evolved. We genetically evolved to an environment that didn't have organophosphates and yeah. you know, neonicotinoids. Being able to change those things also obsoletes so much of the things that are upstream contributing to yeah. so much of the chronic complex illness. Then you start to think about the changes in agriculture to actually remineralize topsoils and affect the microbiome of the topsoils and the quality of the uh, you know food that's coming out and again we have to ask can we have healthy people in in a society where almost everyone is stressed out due to macroeconomic pressures and due to socio-political instability continuously and so there's there's still going to be situations where no matter how well we design it somebody falls and hits their head and we have to deal with that or something that we haven't been able to tend to comes up mm -hmm. but we most of the causes of illness are actually structurally induced at scale in ways that are affecting everyone and you actually can't even avoid currently. So I'm answering the question about the relationship between the practitioner, partly saying I, most of the things practitioners are currently looking at I would like to not exist at all because we're dealing with them upstream, both by doing health promotion and by stopping the things that are doing health degradation. Mm. So that's the first part. Then we can get into what the, when disease is manifesting and we need to deal with it, what that looks like. But we would like to mostly just shrink that category. Mm. Thank you. So before we go, we will definitely need to talk about the, the wider picture of healthcare or healthy life um, and the question of how might we, in, if we were to be able to redesign the healthcare system, and just completely kind of clean the table, start out of the box. What would it? What could it look like? And those will be questions that we would need to answer. And and let's come back to those. So, if you allow, let's stay a little bit longer with with the um, environment that is kind of closer to us right now before we redesign everything. Yeah. So, um, when I look at the the relation between the healthcare provider and and the patient. One of the obvious ch changes right now, and you alluded to this, is the automation of, of healthcare. So more and more processes that, um, you know, just take knowledge. It's all the things that I learned in medical school in terms of data to be, you know, memorized. Um, all the effort it took in, in the initial years of my existence to go through paper cards and finding that paper in Paris and filling out a form and ordering it from this uh, library in Paris and four weeks later the paper would arrive and now everything is available online and we have search engines and text mining and we can integrate all of this and some fantastic new technologies already collecting information and processing this information for me. So there's, that's one element. So, so how am I going to deal with data now? I sometimes feel like I'm in a data crisis, actually. I, yeah, in the beginning, it was a problem to find information. Now I feel like, whoa, <laughs> I have enough. I can't process more. So that's, that's a huge development. And another huge development is the, the, the technological impact. So all the devices that we have, all the techniques and technologies that we have that actually seem, like, seem to have more authority than my own clinical assessment. So I used to, you know, actually do a crazy thing and examine patients, you know. <laughs> now when I examine a patient, um, and if there's something, I would have to validate my finding by some kind of technology. So if I feel that there's some, you know, something, or, you know, I feel the liver is a little bit larger than I would expect, then the next step would be to, to get an ultrasound to validate that that's the case. And it used to be that that, that was the finding. So somehow this the technology is, beco is, is becoming the reference point, is the kind of the objective measure, and whatever we do as human beings is measured against technology. This is worrying to me. Do you see that you know, the, the profession of the physician will be replaced by technology at some point? Are we going to have a robot where I just, you know, like the little photo 
cameras that you had at stations where you sit in, you get four pictures. And so I just walk into some station or some office, and then I put my finger in, I take a bit of blood, and maybe you take a little swab of my, my epithelium in the mouth, and, and there you go, and two minutes later I get some report. Is this the future of medicine? Hopefully, yes and no. Uh, there are things that uh, machine learning can do really better than human cognition. There are things that human cognition do that machine learning can't do at all. Uh, whether we get to artificial general intelligence or not obviously changes that story a bit because then we're talking about things that are less like machines and more like other kinds of beings. Uh, I don't think we're close to that. So we're just talking about machine learning and machine learning mostly that is narrow in type. And so what I think that means is that the machine learning and the diagnostics augment our capacity radically in good ways in the way already your stethoscope and your microscope and your, you know, whatever tools, your glasses you're wearing right now are augmenting your capacity, and it's just continued tools that can do that. So we learn new metrics, new biometrics all the time, parts of the body we didn't even know existed, or parts of physiology, or new types of proteins, and then they're like the center of everything, and they're super important. We can anticipate that that continues for a long time, mm -hmm. that 10 years from now, Nobel Prizes will be won about like breakthrough stuff that we don't even know about right now that will be the main stuff to look at. And so there's no way we're testing that right now, and there's no way that the machine learning is paying attention to that, and yet some of it still comes through a kind of heuristic or intuitive sensibility where you're feeling the liver and you have some sense, even if the liver enzymes don't indicate it or whatever, some other test that we don't currently have does. So I think that the human capacity for general intelligence which includes intuition and things beyond what we currently have metrics on, uh, becomes increasingly important as we're able to offload more of the specialized narrow intelligence. So then the role of the doctor, the practitioner, is largely one that intermediates between really being able to connect with the patient in a holistic, generalized, intuitive, and obviously enough cognitive knowledge to even know how to use this database way, but then doesn't depend exclusively on their own memory. We already don't. We already offload it to books. It's just much better versions of books and papers. And, you know, when we think about the idea of the information singularity, that there can be so much information that no one can be a specialist in any topic. There's 100,000 journal articles a year in the topic of my specialty, so already humans are irrelevant in the information ecology. We don't really need to, like the data isn't what informs our choices. They're, the meaning of being able to put the data of lots of things together does, and the, and the meaningfulness is a second or third derivative of the data. If we can have the machines not just data mine and find the articles, but also be able to make sense of what a lot of those articles together inform as far as treatment goes. So one of the things I want to see the technology get a lot better at doing is being able to do the kind of processing it can so that what you're studying is a higher order synthesis of the information out there that you actually can keep up with. So I see an information singularity much faster than I see a meaningfulness, which is a derivative of the information singularity, which then the doctors are going to be paying attention to. And the researchers are working on helping to make sense of factoring general intelligence. So the fact that we will be able to use increasingly good cameras on an iPhone to look at a skin condition, use image recognition to automatically diagnose the thing at a distance, like that's awesome. Yeah. And there, there are both things that that won't do in terms of physiologic diagnosis and in terms of the quality of connection. And so, and both of those are very important. So um, I think we were talking the other day a little bit about how important it is that we don't automate in ways that lead to more isolation, especially mm. in the name of healthcare, when isolation is one of the number one causes of healthcare issues in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. When you, when you talk about the availability of technology and how this technology may kind of support our decision making and will make it easier for us to provide meaningful health care, and we talked about the temple, 
as in the center of the hospital, if you like, um, is there a sacred space for the human being as a healer? A space that can structurally not be taken on by automation? Um, yes, <laughs> um, I, I think it's I think it's obvious. Um, again, we have to question. Like, let's separate the topic of artificial general intelligence or silica-based life, because now we're talking about life and whether that is possible ever or not in terms of the theoretical possibility of it and what the negative implications of silica-based life trying to share a biosphere with hydrocarbon-based life might be like. That, that's so not near, if ever, that we can take that off. And so really then we're talking about human connection of being able to connect with someone who can actually care about you hmm. and machines that are simply doing input-output processing. We obviously want to extend our capacity with machines and the healthcare, the center of it is actually care. Hmm. So this care, so we have the temple, <laughs> we have the sacred space, we have care as the primary ingredient of the relation between the healthcare provider and the patient. Something that remains a human um, environment, something that remains a human uh, capacity and quality. So if we, this, is, this is something that can be established already in, can be promoted already in the existing healthcare system. Now, you were alluding already to, well, yeah, but healthcare is not limited or confined to either the consultation room or the hospital, as really, whenever a doctor is needed, we're too late when we talk about health. <laughs> so we've already reached a threshold where several non-linear processes have, have scaled up and a threshold has been reached and now the dis-ease has become symptomatic. So we're, we're way too far downstream. So what we really wish to see is if we want to promote health is to address these health issues more upstream. You already alluded to agriculture, finances, uh, social interactions, so what are these areas? So if we're, if we're kind of moving from what is an ideal hospital to what is an ideal healthcare system, how would that change our perspective? What are these elements? As we think about moving forward, we need to think about our actual evolutionary environment in terms of what our genes were selected to actually do well in. Um, because our future environment will be different than that, but it has to not be misaligned with that, right? We've created a world in which we're actually genetically misfit in really important ways, so, so we have to consider this. When we think about the evolutionary environment of humans, the first thing is we're social primates. Hmm. And we, for all of our evolutionary history, were in bands and tribes with extremely close, high trust interaction with lots of other humans. And I mean, we can look at the, how that affects via physical touch and microbiome sharing and pheromone sharing to the actual uh, attachment theory of it, but, and it's going to go beyond any of those specific mechanisms. That's foundational to physical and psychological health. And so we're not just talking about how the infrastructure will work, we're also talking about how the social structures work. Mm -hmm. I think it's really insightful to contemplate how many people you trust as much as anyone in a tribe would have trusted everyone they knew? Mm -hmm. Because most people don't have anyone that they feel like they know as well or knows them as well or they can trust as much as humans evolved being able to trust all the people they knew. And I don't want to over-romanticize. It's not that there weren't difficulties that were associated, but uh, the kind of fierce egalitarianism tribes had to have to be able to function together well. Like in a tribe you can't have right, left antipathy and stay together, right? You can't have internal defection. You actually can't even get away with lying because everyone's going to tell. There's a forced transparency at that small scale. And so we actually need extraordinarily high trust environments for psychological health and we need psychological health for physiological health. 
So that's one example. So when we just uh, stay with the social interaction for now, and that's one of your favorite topics, <laughs> is how to, what is the impact of a societal development um, on, the, on, on various factors? So if, if in this conversation we focus on health, what would be key societal developments that we would like to see, again, kind of time warping forwards to 2050, what would we like to see in place in, in our societies that would reduce the healthcare, the attention in healthcare facilities as we have them today? So could we kind of address some of the problems that we see in hospitals now already upstream? It's funny to kind of think about what examples to use because it's pretty much everything. It's like every building material we use, almost every building material, outgasses volatile organic compounds from petrol derivatives that are either neurotoxins, endocrine disruptors, or carcinogens. So it's the restructuring of the entire materials economy and materials supply chain to not be polluting the indoor and outdoor environment. It's that the, that the actual photic spectrum of the light that we're in is unhealthy for us because we don't just photosynthesize vitamin D, nitric oxide and uh, cortisol and so many other things are regulated by not just the total amount of light but specific frequencies of light and timing of light. It's like the, the nuclear family home structure, the nature of economies of scale moving agriculture far away where even if it was organic which it generally isn't it's old it's been actually undergoing entropy since being picked for a pretty long time which means nu nutrient decay um, let alone lack of interaction with the soil that not only has a kind of psychological regeneration but microbiotic effects like <coughs> we can see that market forces Mm. moved the world to a place that optimizes for market forces and they optimize for addiction and comfort rather than health or well-being. Mm. And I think this is a really important thing is that yeah. <laughs> com comfort and happiness are, are not the same thing. Uh. But as soon as we, one of, one of the effects of kind of the enlightenment was moving into the domain of objectivism and things we could measure. Mm -hmm. Well, we can actually measure metrics of comfort, like how bouncy the shocks in a car are or whatever, more than we can measure subjectivity, which we can't measure at all. And that gets into existentialism of what is a meaningful human experience. And so we start optimizing for comfort, and you actually make shitty people when you optimize for comfort, because psychologically good people are people that can actually hold a certain resilience in the presence of discomfort. So you look at the wisdom traditions that had sweat lodges and ayahuasca ceremonies and combo ceremonies and sun dances and vision quests, which were all actually induced really intense discomfort to be able to find a self-transcendence in the presence of it in the same way that you don't get strong people by not lifting weights, right? Mm -hmm. You actually have to hormetically stress the system to upregulate its regulatory capacity. Mm -hmm. You have to psychologically stress the emotional system to learn emotional intelligence. And so there's so much of the in the name of comfort that is just actually making maximally entropic humans. Mm. And the same with like supposedly market theory says people will demand real things that are actually gonna enrich the quality of their life like food and whatever. And then that will create a basis for people to create supply and the best supply will end up getting upregulated. But of course, as soon as we start recognizing economies of scale on the supply side and the supply side becomes a much bigger organism yeah. than the demand side and it is going to benefit from more profit. Now it wants to figure out how to manufacture artificial demand that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So then the business has the goal of maximize lifetime revenue of a customer and I maximize lifetime revenue of a customer by driving addiction starting in childhood. So if I can have social media and entertainment that's maximally addictive, that figures out psychologically exactly how to have the right type of dings to get you back on and make you feel miserable if you don't have it and do the same thing with food and et cetera, then we can have the plausible deniability, I'm providing what people want. Yes, after you drove addiction in them using asymmetric information and narrative and technology warfare to drive that addiction, but this does not create healthy or happy people or a good society. 
So you actually have to change the whole nature of perverse incentive and market dynamics writ large to be producing goods and services that are actually supporting the health and well-being and integrity of people in society. So it, the redesign is pretty much everything. <laughs> so if I, if I just you know, put this into a pediatrician's kind of way, <laughs> making it simple, <laughs> then what I understand from you is that the entire concept of healthcare as a service that is being paid for, including all the products that are being that are part of this service or come along with this service is not in line with the, in, with, with the concept of health as you're describing it. So all of this works as long as we have disease. So if we have a problem to be solved, if we have a disease and we give it a name and we give it a label, that allows us then to say, if you have that disease, then you need this kind of diagnostics and therefore you need these sort of machines and therefore you need these sort of treatments. Congratulations, you're sincerely. Thank you very much. So that is that is one um, that is one aspect. And the other is when we actually want health rather than the absence of disease, then all of this is 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 a misfit. So whatever we have constructed in terms of healthcare system, trying to overcome disease as a system is not useful if if we're actually turning our focus towards health. Is that? I mean, it's funny. Even if we just think about disease diagnosis, I think most of the actual diseases that we have diagnostics for are made up. They're, fi they're fictions. So obviously ADHD is a fiction that is just making childhood a disease and that is <laughs> take, take kids, have parents pay no attention to them, Pay, like, if you think about what the fuck school is, the way that we have it structured, it's these, pe these little people don't make money yet. And so they are possibly future assets in the financial system, but right now they're liabilities or, or, or debts on the future system. So we want the least number of productive class people to monitor the most of them possible. So one teacher to 30 of them, typically a low paid person because someone that could do something more profitable, we'd rather them generating more profit to get them to the point where they're part of the productive class. And as soon as they're too old to be the productive class, and again, we want to ship them off somewhere where one low paid person takes care of lots of them. Like, the, so we start with that, and a school system that doesn't facilitate their interest in anything, forces them to be interested in totally uninteresting shit, breaks their interest in life as a result, so then they want to play video games and watch porn or whatever, and then we say that's the way that's what human nature is. It's only human nature after we broke it, right? Mm -hmm. So then we medicate that as a d disease because that's also a super profitable thing to do. And then that creates the beginning of an iatrogenic cascade where the Ritalin, the side effects of the Ritalin are going to need an SSRI later and then are going to need a benzo. And then that person's fucked for life. But the, the profitability is quite high in terms of lifetime revenue because if I drive, rather than helping people be healthy, if I override their system in a way that's going to cause ongoing addiction because they can't get off that benzo because they're going to have rolling panic attacks if they do way worse than their anxiety initially ever was. But the side effects of that are another drug that we also sell. That's just called an upsell or a cross sell, which is just good business. So like obviously ADHD is a bullshit disease. Most psychiatric diagnoses, it would be way more useful to think about it differently. Hmm. But also like every complex chronic disease, they're bullshit diseases in terms of rheumatoid arthritis. We call it a disease or MS or Alzheimer's. Mm. They don't have the same cause. Mm. If I see 10 different people with MS there, and I actually found out what's going on, because right now we don't know what's going on at all. So the, the disease just allows us to know what symptomatic drugs or ameliorative drugs we're going to do, but we can't cure any of them. But if I want to say what's actually going on, the pathoetiology is different in every case. Mm because they're multifactorial and they're not the same set of factors. And so the fact that there's a cluster of biomarkers and a cluster of symptoms that I can make a, a 
disease title for it to then know what drug to prescribe, and insurance can do that thing, doesn't mean that that tells me anything about the pathophysiology of it. So even insofar as I'm thinking about the disease, I see MS, I don't, I don't know shit when I hear MS. All I know is, okay, so there's some kind of autoimmune neurodegenerative stuff going on. This system was exposed to some things that created dysregulation, mm -hmm. deviations from homeodynamics that probably led to more susceptibility to more dysregulation that eventually reached a threshold that had symptomology where there was probably pathophysiology going on for years or decades ahead of time. And for this person with MS, it, it was a mold exposure 30 years ago that left mycotoxins that changed cytokine profiles and whatever that then 10 years later, they had a micro TBI from a car accident and then a divorce stress that threw them over and now it's MS. And in somebody else, it was a tick-borne Lyme exposure and then some food poisoning in Guatemala and some glyphosate and then some other emotional stressor. So to actually be able to cure it, I need to know that stuff, which the title MS doesn't give me. So not only do we want to move to health promotion, like we want to even think about disease in a reasonable way. That is so interesting. <laughs> It's so interesting because this, the way we do studies, at least when, when I look at the studies, that those are the classic type of clinical studies. What we, what we see is that, that there's, uh, there, there are basically two observations. So there's, uh, there's, there's a starting point and an end point, and then we assume that there's a linear association between the two. And it seems that as we are, as we are learning more, um, as, as there's, an, uh, there's more insight into um, how we might be able to calculate nonlinear associations, yeah. and we're recognizing that that probably a lot of what is happening during this time of observation in a classic clinical trial, um, what we observe there is is very much dependent on what happened before this trial and all the things that you're actually describing, and the heterogeneity that that is 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 real um, is not usually captured in the kind of typical table one in a paper saying, you know, what is the distribution of sex and gender and ethnicity? So this is way, way more complex than that. And we haven't even started to come to grips with the complexity of what, what the regulatory mechanisms are before we start to observe something. Right. So, so a lot of what I hear from you is that a lot of the science that, that, um, that we look at, so that a lot of clinical science is based on a, a syndromic diagnosis so we're saying that this, this, this patient group shares a certain set of signs and symptoms, and if it's that, then we give it a name, and that's a useful thing to give it a name, so we have a working hypothesis and can talk about it. But along the line of this process of discovering what is actually going on, we are kind of taking this diagnosis as something set, as something that exists as an, as an entity, rather than a working hypothesis. So. Then we started developing drugs to fix a problem, so to fix the signs and symptoms, which is a good idea for those who do have the signs and symptoms. So it's at least very promising if you do suffer of MS, as the, the, uh, the example you gave. If there are solutions to the problem that I experience to the signs and symptoms, that's a useful thing. But we could recognize that this is like a painkiller <laughs> rather than something that really addresses the cause of disease. So what might be the steps for us? What would be the structural approach to take in the future so that we're actually turning our direction and really drill down to the cause of disease rather than trying to fix signs and symptoms. Yeah. And, you know, don't get me wrong, symptomatic medicine and palliative care and, mm. you know, ameliorating some of the, the um, advancement of pathology like this, awesome. No, Novocaine is one of the best inventions ever. Dentistry totally sucked before Novocaine. So, uh, that's not addressing something at a causal level, but it's awesome, right? So, but we can do so much better and th there's a place where, okay, so let's say I'm looking at the relationship between the regulatory bodies, so in the US, the FDA in particular, other bodies, AMA and whatever, but let's look at the FDA for is this a treatment that can actually, uh, a doctor can give to treat a disease, right? So the disease has been recognized, the treatment's been recognized. And otherwise, a doctor's not allowed to use it, insurance won't cover it, whatever, right? So we look at what it takes to get the regulatory status, which also means then that it will get trained to new people in medical school. 
Well, so phase three clinical trials are gonna cost a billion dollars. Most of a billion dollars, but now factoring all the things that don't make it through, and matriculating that, right, a billion dollars. And so the only way to ever be able to recoup that money is if I can patent the thing, because otherwise someone else who's just competing on cost of goods and they didn't put the billion dollars up is just gonna beat me. And so if I'm looking at patentable stuff, then I look at the regulatory dynamics around patenting. I can only patent synthetic molecules. And that means that the things I'm looking at are not part of how your body worked when it was healthy and are not part of the evolutionary environments that made humans in the first place at all, ever. So what's the chance we're gonna be able to do health promotion with weird synthetic molecules that were never part of the original picture because the intersection of the regulatory landscape and IP law and the financialization of the research make it to where we can't even study the right stuff. So let's say I looked at when the same person with the same genome didn't have cancer and they were super healthy and now that they have cancer, what was different in their body or before mm -hmm. the autoimmune disease and I see that there are certain cell types and certain peptides that are much more uh, prevalent and other ones that are less prevalent and I'd start to think about types of biological endogenous medicine I could do. Well, I, I can't even research most of that because I'll never be able to patent it, which means there's no money for the research mm -hmm. to ever be able to get it through clinical approval. So um, basically the epistemology that looks for one drug, I mean one disease, set of symptoms, one drug, it's totally dumb epistemology, but the there is no incentive to be able to try and do better complex epistemology from a finance regulatory point of view. So the epistemics are actually straightforward, which is acute causation, acute singular causation is straightforward. You got a physical injury that was an acute injury, we're going to sew it up, don't do that thing again, right? Um, or you had an acute infectious exposure, we're gonna give you the antibiotic for it, even that starts getting questionable because mm. did everyone who is exposed get the same thing and do you actually have underlying immune weakness um, and is the antibiotic actually necessary and are you breeding antibiotic resistance in the whole population by using it unnecessarily? There's questions there, but let's just say there are times where that's true in acute yep. thing. Um, but most disease does not have a single cause and the causes, so they're multifactorial, they're different for different people and many of them are radically time delayed. And so to actually be able to do curative work, we've actually got to be able to assess how the regulatory systems of the body are doing and what the deviations to homeodynamics that the person has been exposed to are, find the unique set, be able to specially reverse that unique set and generally support the homeodynamic systems of the body. It's a totally different way of thinking about medicine. Hmm. So one of the, so you're talking about, in a way you're talking about personalized medicine, precision medicine, terms that have been used in different ways, but let's say N equals one medicine. Yeah. Uh, part of how research is done right now um, is, is to understand what is going on in a single case by looking at similar cases and comparing them and trying to understand the pattern. So what we do, the, the approach to research is to kind of look at the, to the disease from the outside and recognize patterns of disease that are similar come uh, in a group of people that we observe. That is essentially different to the disease experience of the person who had this threshold, this multifactorial threshold experience. How do we, so it's basically the way we conduct research today is, is completely missing the point. It's not useless, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Cl you. Clinical trials aren't totally useless. Being able to do variable isolation and seeing what that variable does across the distribution of all the other variables gives us an insight, right? So when we do a clinical trial on a drug compared to a placebo and we're trying to see is there some effect beyond the placebo and we see there is versus there isn't, there is indicates that there is some mechanism that's occurring. That's kind of all it tells us, that there's some mechanism. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there's a Gaussian distribution of the response curve where some people have great responses and some maybe have terrible responses is a result of lots of other things that are going on that we don't recognize so they just get put under a bell curve. And it would be much more interesting if we could start to figure that stuff out. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do that with looking, with variable isolation on a large population. Mm -hmm. um, so now when I move all the way to n equals one, where I'm looking at a population of one and trying to look at all the variables and look at how they make sense together, <laughs> I've got it, 
now I've got to use complexity science. I've got to use much more advanced kind of statistical modeling. Um, but there are ways of simplifying it because we know that if I just try and do the brute force computation, there are things we can't measure, right? So I can, I can put a QEG on you, but I can't see subcortical structures. There's no good way to see that in real time. There's lots of proteins we can't measure. That, and, and there's sh sh shit that we just don't even know that we don't know about yet that is sh a huge part of it. And if I tried to run optimization on it, it's not computable. These are NP-hard problems. But I can, I can collapse that entire space to ways of thinking about it that make sense, which is, is the system not getting enough of something it needs? Is it getting too much of something to be able to process well? Mm -hmm. Like this is kind of Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine basics, but that we can modernize. So is it not getting enough of something? Is it not getting enough exercise, rest, love, affection, sunlight, micronutrients, macronutrients? So let's say we look at micronutrients. We need to think about subclinical deficiency as opposed to clinical deficiency. Mm -hmm. So most people don't have scurvy, right? That's awesome that they don't have scurvy. But if we look at optimal vitamin C and then we look at scurvy, there's a pretty big range in here that is don't yet have scurvy, but that is suboptimal. So we'd call that subclinical deficiency where being able to augment those levels would make a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, because I've got so many micronutrients to look at, if I just try to control that one variable and look at decreased all-cause mortality or whatever, it's going to be really hard to tell because that one thing also needs bioflavonoids synergistically to work and is going to interact like there's so many other things going on. So if I start to look overarchingly at are we providing good nutrition and is this person absorbing and assimilating it and dealing with subclinical deficiency, also toxicity. So until we have re-engineered our supply chains, do I want to look at the exposure people have to heavy metals, to VOCs, to mycotoxins, also to infections that are subclinical, meaning they're not creating acute medical symptomology, but this is not a normal part of a human microbiome. Mm -hmm. And when we look at an H. pylori or an HPV or an EBV that we know have statistical correlations with diseases that are chronic infections, there's a gazillion other things that do. Functional medicine and kind of functional infectious ex Explorative medicine are starting to pioneer this more than general medicine, but this is too much of something that the body shouldn't have. We can do stuff about that. So there's a way of taking this entire search space and optimization space and having some kind of heuristic diagnostics that are able to get a, do a lot of the work more simply. We can also think about the primary regulatory mechanisms of the body and how to look at the robustness of them, which indicates everything that's going on. So like. I want to be able to look not just at the homeostatic state, is your vitamin D, your heart rate, your cholesterol within a level. I want to look at the homeodynamic capacity that when I stress it, how far out does it go and how quickly does it come back? Because mm -hmm. if we don't just want to define disease, we want to define health in a way we can measure. If we want to start to think about the objectivity of it, then I would define health as related to the robustness of the homeodynamic regulatory mechanisms. How much stress the being can be exposed to without going into pathophysiology, without deviating from the homeodynamics. So we, that's a different set of tests. We need to stress test stuff, right? <laughs> and so I would like to see more of those things. Then we can define disease as some of those homeodynamic markers are actually out of range <laughs> and pathophysiology is occurring. <laughs> Aging is not yet disease, they're in range, but there's less robustness, which means more susceptibility to disease, meaning smaller stresses can cause larger strain. Mm -hmm. And so then the kind of anti-aging um, prevent preventative health promotion work is just increasing the robustness of the regulatory mechanism. So we both want to measure and think about the body's regulatory dynamics and how to promote those generally, as well as look at the specific causes of pathology and how to reverse them specifically. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. So when we, you're talking about homeodynamic systems, so basically the regulations, the, all the different regulatory processes going on within a body that maintain some sort of range of what we perceive within the realm of ease rather than dis-ease, which is probably then at the outliers of the Bell's curve. So when we look at When we look at these regulatory mechanisms within a system, we still assume that body is a closed system. 
And I wonder from what you said before whether that's actually an assumption we should take. Or whether we should also look at a perspective that assumes that this body has probably some mechanisms that run within, but probably also it is at least susceptible to or interfering with mechanisms that, that are around that body. So in this, okay, so let's look at layers of holisticness and, or comprehensivity and consideration. So we can't just do the vertical slices called neurology, gastroenterology, rheumatology, oncology, because most of the complex things occur across those. Yeah. Right? If we look at gut-brain axis dynamics, that's gastroenterology, neurology, immunology, rheumatology, all mixed together where no specialist is going to see the thing. Right? So we have to look at the interaction of all the body systems. We also have to look at the horizontal slices, the omics of it's not just what's happening at the genomic level and the epigenetic and the proteomic, but also how the top-down connectomic stuff and neuroendocrine stuff is affecting the bottom-up stuff. So we want to think about all the body systems together. But then it's not just the body systems of the individual, it's the body and mind, psyche, emotion, spirit of the individual, right? So we want to be thinking about how all of those interact. But then it's not just the individuals, the individual interacting with the greater world and universe they're part of, both physically and psychologically, right? Metaphysically. So physically, I find the person has mycotoxins and I send them home to a house that still has mold in it. Like, obviously we have to address the physical environment they're in. Or, we know very clearly that the lifestyle of people is going to be affected by the lifestyle of the people they're spending a lot of time around more than almost anything else. So the person has illnesses associated with obesity and I send them home to an environment and a community in which the health habits of everyone suck and are self-reinforcing and would be ostracizing if they did something different or where the person's really lonely and loneliness we know drives addiction. So I, I've got to think about the, the physiological and psychological interactions of the being with their environment and what's necessary. So when we think about a integrative or a holistic medicine or healthcare, it has to factor all that. So to what degree is a sense of isolation or separation a cause of disease? Whether it's the subjective experience of feeling separated? Is that, is that a statement you could go along with? that, that the sense of separation is, is a sense that I may create, but it is an illusionary sense, whilst there is nothing but a connect, an interconnectedness. So as soon as I perceive myself as separate from that one interconnectedness, this is a cause of disease? When you say that the disconnection is illusory, while that is true on some levels, it's also switching the burden to the individual perception where maybe they actually have social dynamics that really are ostracizing or really are don't have real connection in it. Of course, insofar as I'm talking to the individual, I want to help them figure out how to, they can take more agency to change their life. But insofar as I'm thinking about how to change systems, I want to say, how do we make systems that support individuals more? That's kind of the classically right and left perspective, individual or collective focus. You have to do both and pay attention to the virtuous cycle between them. Um, when you look at work of people like Gabor Mate and others on attachment theory and how much the sense of isolation drives addiction, which then drives so many other things from a health perspective, I think this is huge. But it's also like when we look at mass shooters, none of them th that I'm aware of had healthy, meaningful relationships before being mass shooters. So news goes in interviews and says they were mm. all the neighbors, and the neighbors say the person was a loner, they totally kept to themselves, nobody ever saw them. Which means that person was getting pro to progress in their how disenfranchised they felt, how depressed, how misanthropic they were with nobody knowing and checking, which is also why I don't want a world that allows people, that makes it very easy for people to be isolated that much. So if Amazon's gonna come deliver the stuff at the door and my doctor on the phone can do that, people can be progressing in their psychopathology radically and then having access to more destructive tools than hu earlier humans had. Right now, AR-15s and beyond that, weaponized drones, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just that 
the isolation is bad for the person. It's that the isolation makes those people very dangerous to the health of the society as a whole. And so it's actually important that as we're thinking about redesigning civilization, we're making the processes by which people get their basic resources provisioned and needs met involve interacting with other humans in healthy, enriching ways. Otherwise, the intersection of people that are progressing in psychopathology with decentralized catastrophic technology is a major problem for the world. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for all your insights that you've shared with us. It's become very clear to me that uh, when we change, when we direct our attention towards health and less on disease, there's no way we can limit it to an individual. We have to think systemically. There's no way we get, um, we can limit it to the consultation room. We have to think about the environment, the immediate environment, the social environment, and, and all the other major parameters um, that, we, that constitute health uh, in terms of social environments, in terms of agriculture, in terms of environmental pollution. And we didn't, we, you only touched on uh, the financial aspects and how the, um, how markets driving um, uh, the healthcare system as it is uh, at the moment having a major impact. Thank you very much for giving us such an extraordinary broad overview. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. What a great pleasure to have you here. Daniel Schmachenberger. <laughs>